welcome everyone. Marina and I are happy to have you here um, for another Art and Conversation seminar. Today's session is dedicated to perception of portraits. As usual, we invited two, two experts uh, that have different background to share their point of view on the same topic. After the two talks, uh, we will open a discussion and everyone will have a chance to ask a question or share a comment. You can either type in your question in the chat or raise your virtual hand and we'll give you the opportunity to ask a question. Um, now, our first speaker today is David Perret, who is a professor of psychology at the School of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of St. Andrews. Professor Perret studies how we recognize uh, uh, facial attributes and understand actions of others, and uh, he is the head of the Perception Lab. He's interested in the relationship between health and attractiveness, the impact of childhood parental relationships and development across puberty on May choices in adulthood, attraction to voice and pheromones, decoding emotional expression and perception, sharing of attention, and the use of computer graphic to announce their recognition. So, Professor Perret, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, we look forward to your talk. Uh, please feel free to share the screen. Thank you. Just take a, take a second. Okay, so my brief was to discuss how we perceive portraits and, and particularly to go into the psychological mechanisms. Is that is that okay? Is it visible for everybody? Yeah. Yes. Okay, um, and, and to look at um, how aesthetic judgments are made. Now, I don't have much to say about aesthetics, but um, I, my thesis today is really that evolution can contribute to aesthetic aesthetics through cues to sex typicality, infancy and health. I'll just use those as three examples. And portraits, I think, use these cues to uh, have an aesthetic effect. So um, here's a, a technique. Um, there's three faces of women here. Um, if we define the structure of each woman, we can find out where the, the nose tip lies on average, where the, the tip of the chin lies on average. And what we can do then, excuse me, together and find the average shape. When we've got the average shape, we can change the individual images so they conform to this average average shape. And that's what I've done there. Now, the point of doing that is when we add them together, we get uh, an image which is not blurred, it's in focus. Now, since we put uh, not just three faces here, we put 50 faces into the the average. Note that uh, all of the faces we put in were women, they were all European women, they were all adults. So that's uh, maintained in the group average. The typical features appear there. But I'll use that technique throughout today's talk. Um, something that's been noticed for more than 100 years is that uh, average faces are attractive. Galton noted this uh, more than a century ago, and Langlois uh, and Rogman argued that really attractiveness is averageness. They noted that if you put 32 faces uh, together, that was the most attractive they could build uh, compared to individuals or even an eight face average. So they're arguing that um, beauty is really averageness. And there could be an evolutionary explanation for that, um, that uh, if we're attracted to average, we would be avoiding extreme uh, genetic um, mutations. Um, There's a psychological explanation, which isn't incompatible, and that is when we see something often, we tend to like it. It's called the mere exposure effect, and adverts work on that principle. The more often you see something, the more often you, you'll think positively about it. And I want to go on from averageness and talk about exaggeration. So here we've got portraits done by uh, Botticelli. There are eight female faces and we can combine them all. And that's the, the computer average in the centre. Um, so individual features like the droopy eyelids that are present in most of his images do come through. We can notice it's a sepia colour and we can notice the triangular shape of the, the jaw, which is quite unusual. But we can do that for different artists. So 
here the various artists that uh, reach with um, average the paintings of women that the artist did. And having done that, we can compare, uh, we can combine all of these, and now we have a representation of um, the average artist, if you like. It's how women were painted by many different artists. Interestingly, when you've got the information about an average woman's face and the particular artist style, you can inject that onto faces. So again, we've got lots of different artists here. Um, uh, and we can take one person that worked in my laboratory, Rachel Edwards, and we can inject, if you like, the information about a single artist style. So all of the uh, six faces on the right uh, surrounding Rachel are representations of Rachel and they hold a resemblance for her identity and they hold also a resemblance of the art style which we've superimposed. So uh, we can use the information uh, to create a resemblance of somebody maintaining a particular art style. What I really want to talk about is um, exaggeration. If we take an average artist again, compare it to Botticelli, we can find out those differences rather than applying them to one person's face. We can use that information to exaggerate the way Botticelli painted. And here is the uh, result. We've got a, a caricature, if you like, of Botticelli, 75% exaggeration. So the eyelids are more droopy, the chin is more triangular, the nose is longer. And an experiment I did with art historians in, in St Andrews, I showed them original paintings um, with the background removed and asked them which artist it was. And we can get a measure of their accuracy. And they, the art historians were pretty good at the uh, cutout images. Um, but when we showed them caricatures, recognition performance improved. So um, we can see then as a benefit uh, to visual recognition from exaggerations. I'll, I'll do another um, perhaps amusing instance of this. We can take politicians like Boris Johnson or David Cameron and can compare them to the average male figure or average politician. And note particular characteristics about Boris. He's got a round face, his eyes are quite close together, whereas uh, David Cameron's got a long face, uh, a large forehead. Um, we can take the information and exaggerate the difference from average. So these images are now becoming preposterous. They're, they're not real. No uh, human really looks like that. It, it works for any political party. It doesn't have to be conservatives. But I think these are grotesque. Uh, they're certainly unattractive and they're not average. So that conforms with uh, Langlois's theory of beauty. Um, what I'm interested in, again, is the recognition. If we show these images, what happens? We can take an original photograph. Um, we could give you a name, say, Donald Trump, and then show you uh, a, a face. And if you agree that's Donald Trump, you press one button. You're relatively quick. If I show you a caricature, you're actually quicker. So all of these um, experiments are showing us that uh, our recognition system is coding differences from average. And when we exaggerate those differences, recognition is more efficient. Shape exaggeration speeds up recognition. So face caricatures, they exaggerate deviation from average and that can improve recognition. It implies coding is uh, by means of the differences from average. Now, I said earlier that there was a theory about beauty, that it was averageness. Um, I, I don't think that's true, because if you do an experiment as follows, you can take 60 women and sure enough, the average looks attractive. But if you take the most attractive uh, top quarter of those women and make uh, a composite of their face, it's subtly different. Moreover, you can exaggerate the difference and uh, then give these three images to um, raters, evaluators, and ask them to give a, a rating on an attractiveness scale. Sure enough, they're all attractive, 
but the most exaggerated um, features receive the highest ratings. So there's a quality um, that about attractiveness that differs from average. Despite all of that, um, I still haven't told you anything uh, about what attractiveness is. And uh, beauty is more than averageness, but what is it? And in the remaining time, I want to um, talk about uh, sex differences. Um, and in the animal kingdom, sexual selection often ends up uh, with extremely exaggerated features. So this, these are uh, on the right, we've got male widow birds and the widow bird with the longest tail is being approached by most females. There's a widow bird on the left with a short tail. Um, the number of uh, females in his territory is reduced. So the sexual selection in, in birds and in many species for exaggerated uh, traits that are sexually dimorphic. I'd like you to decide which of these two images you think is more attractive. Now they're only subtly different, but you have to, if you take a guess, you might uh, vote for one. To show you how these images differ, we took Japanese uh, female students and Japanese male students and found the difference in their face shape and applied it so that we could move uh, a female face away from the males. That would be feminizing and uh, we could masculinize it. Most of this research um, is in large agreement that feminization um, makes faces more attractive when they're female. To give you another example, uh, in three dimensions this time, we can take information now as the head turns to the left, it becomes more and more feminine. As it turns to the right, it becomes more and more masculine. Now note the particular feminized uh, shape. It's quite round and the eyebrows are relatively high uh, on the face. So as we look um, in terms of exaggerating femininity, that seems to increase attractiveness. But I want to go back to portrait arts artists, and I think this is my subjective opinion, but I think what Renoir is doing here is he's exaggerating uh, cues to femininity. And likewise, Vermeer in the girl with the uh, pearl earring, I think these are exaggerated feminine traits that are being used by the artist to uh, exaggerate the allure of the depicted individuals. So portraits can exaggerate femininity. What about male faces? Um, in this example, I don't know whether this interactive works for you, but we can give people a choice and they can dial up where they think the face is most attractive. The result of this experiment as is shown here. We've got uh, masculinity along the uh, bottom of the screen going running left to right. And we've also got the attractiveness rating. Now note, when we made this experiment, um, it wasn't the most average masculinity that was most attractive. It was an exaggerated masculinity. In fact, it was 80% um, exaggerated masculinity was the most attractive configuration for this uh, uh, experiment. So um, I, I think he, here I'm exaggerating masculinity. And I think if we look in art, uh, there's plenty of examples. Here we've got a, a Roman sculpture. And I think, um, again, the traits that are being shown are really hyper masculine. And that may be done for a particular purpose. It may be done to show strength. It may be done to have an effect on attractiveness. So enhanced feminine uh, face shape is attractive in women. Enhanced masculine shape can be attractive in men as the exact attraction or masculinity desire does depend on the environment and it does depend on biological factors. Um, portrait artists can use these cues and they can display more allure or they can display things like traits like strength using the sex differences. But attractiveness is not all about uh, sexual attractiveness. I'd, I'd ask you to decide which one of these two uh, adorable faces is cutest? Which one looks most cute? And uh, take your time and, and pick one. It turns out this task is quite difficult for men. Um, that's just the way the data goes. Uh, men are not as sensitive to cuteness as, as women. 
that's uh, the reasons for that may be apparent. But what have we done here? Well, we've taken infantile cues, such as a large forehead, large eyes and a small chin. And we've exaggerated them on the left. So commonly, um, most people agree that the left hand image looks cuter. What do I mean by cute? That's a strange concept, but it may be how uh, parental you feel towards the infant, how much you want to pick it up and cuddle it, um, etc. Of course, artists can use these cues too. And it's of interest that, to me that the manga style in, in Japan cartoons, we can see an example on the bottom right, uh, is an exaggeration of all the infantile cues like uh, very large eyes, very small chin and a large forehead. So uh, exaggeration of an infantile, uh, in infantile face shape, uh, it can, I think, trigger parental behaviour. And the cues to infancy are common throughout the animal kingdom. So you get some very bizarre um, uh, effects working across species. So here we've got a, a cat on the on the left and it's got a it's, its own kitten but it's also looking after some young ducklings so um, whereas the cat might eat the ducklings at some time here the mother cat has adopted the young ducklings and that can happen even in nature um, in, in Africa we've got a, a lioness who adopting a young gazelle um, despite the fact that other members of her pride might actually want to eat that so there's a very powerful parental uh, trigger for parental behaviour here. I, I want to deal on one final subject, not about face shape, but about um, other aspects of the faith, face. And I want, want you um, to make a decision about the following two images. Which one do you think looks healthier? Just give you a moment to decide. You'd be correct technically if you said the one on the right is healthier because that's um, 20 people that have received a placebo injection. The individuals on the left are 20 individuals combined and they've received a bacterial toxin under a hospital condition that was investigating uh, reactions to toxins. Um, within an hour of the toxin, um, individuals uh, have changed in many ways and you can see these cues if I exaggerate them that the sickness has been enhanced there and there are changes to the expression the eye openness but there are uh, changes also to the skin color and particularly if you look at the lips they're vaguely blue. So, What contributes a healthy color? I'd like you to uh, enter an experiment with me. If you put one hand in the air like this lizard and put the other hand down towards the ground and just stay like that for uh, 10 seconds. Now, if you've got good lighting in the room, can you bring your hands together and look at them? You may see the hand that was in the air is pale. So that's an illustration of the effect of uh, blood on the color of the skin. Now, if I go back to experiments that run off that, if we ask which of the following two faces looks more attractive, there are very subtle differences in colour. And um, the normal choice is to say the one with slightly more blood colour in the face looks more attractive. The point is that skin redness can have an effect. It, it decreases naturally um, with sickness um, and an increase in blood colour within the skin looks healthy. Artists know this too. Um, we can see an artist's depiction of health on the left and illness on the right. And one, one of the colours is different. If you look at the lips, I know that the face is frowning, but um, the lips are a particular blue colour. And even if we, we look at one artist, Caravaggio, depicting Bacchus, he's chosen on the right to depict Bacchus in a rather sick state, with blue lips, and on the left with a more healthy glow. Um, and I think artists can know these cues and exaggerate them. I'll end with one picture of uh, our very own Bonnie Prince Charlie, and he's certainly got some exaggerated colour added to him by the artist. 
to to just sum up, um, I think evolution ensures attraction to various features like sex typicality um, and infant appearance for different aims. One might be reproductive, but one is also parental. Um, but we're also attracted to health, and by avoiding illness, we may uh, increase our longevity. So portraits can use these effects. OK, that's that's the end of the talk. I'll just stop presenting. Fantastic. Thank you very much, David. That was great. Um, all your questions and comments, please don't forget them. You'll have a chance to ask them. Um, and now we have our second speaker. It's Jesse Prince, Professor of Philosophy at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Professor Prince leads the Committee for Interdisciplinary Science Studies and the Philosophy Lab. In his research, he combines both philosophical and experimental methods. He works uh, in the philosophy of psychology mostly and investigates perception, emotion, thought and behavior. The nature of art is one of his main research interests. Um, he published a lot on emotions and the role of emotions in aesthetic judgments, empathy and moral judgments, consciousness and embodiment. His books include works of wonder, a theory of art. In this book, he argues that emotion of wonder underlies our evaluative judgments with respect to the goodness of works of art. Professor Prince, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and we look forward to your talk. Please feel free to share your screen. Yeah, my mute was being stubborn. It wasn't uh, staying <laughs> off, so apologies for that uh, delay. Okay. Um, many thanks for that introduction. Really delighted to be a part of this this conversation today. Um, I won't talk much about um, experimental work I've done in this area. I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a art historical detour, and in part to be a um, counterpoint to some of the themes that uh, that Dave Parrott brought out, because uh, while I do think there is uh, an enormously interesting story to tell about ways in which aspects of our universal or shared psychology, psychology that might be shared even with non-human animals, contributes to our uh, perception and reception of art, there is also an enormous contribution of culture, and I really want to focus on that side of the equation uh, for my 20 minutes. So. Um, I'm going to begin with the question about how we uh, determine what a portrait depicts, uh, how a portrait succeeds in capturing its likeness. And um, I'm going to, in the next 20 minutes, consider three really tempting views about response to portraits that I want to complicate or raise uh, some doubts about. So a tempting view here is that portraits depict because they look like uh, or resemble their subjects and engage the very same facial recognition response that would be engaged were we to encounter the sitter of the portrait in person. So this is an artist's rendition of what the actual um, Jaconda or Mona Lisa might have looked like. And on this tempting view, the way we are able to recognize the face in the Mona Lisa is that it engages face recognition systems that would be operative if we were looking at the real individual. Um, and I think there's obviously some truth to this. There's enormous structural similarity between some artistic representations and actual faces, um, but as a complete view, it's going to fall short. For one thing, viewers typically have no way to judge whether a representation resembles its sitter, unless it's uh, uh, the rare exception where you actually have physical contact with the sitter. Um, most of the art we see in life represents people we've never had occasion to um, encounter. Moreover, were we to encounter the person, they would look different in really radical ways than an image would. We have no difficulty seeing that a painting is a painting or a sculpture is a sculpture. They don't uh, engage the exact same perceptual uh, mechanisms. If they did, we would constantly be mistaking art for reality, which we almost never do. And as Dave already brought out, art um, tends to capitalize on idealizations. It exaggerates, it inflates, it distorts. Um, and those are all aspects uh, that are used in perception, as, as he mentioned, but they're much more characteristic of faces we, we get in art than faces we get in the real world. Uh, but my main focus is going to be on cultural variation, um, because I think when you start to look at how portraiture works across culture, um, the idea that portraits are always exact likenesses of those they depict 
uh, begins to look uh, less plausible um, when taken as a, as a global claim. Um, if you consider ancient Egypt, for example, um, a, a standard view about what Egyptian art does is that it idealizes to an extreme. And one, one way to articulate that idea, um, which is, I think, not quite right, is that Egyptian art uses generics. It presents generic archetypes of uh, royal personages like the pharaoh, um, presenting them in ways that are uniform across uh, different reigns. And this turns out not to exactly be true. If you look at Egyptian portrait sculpture, uh, you do find recognizable features that we do, would allow you, if you had the art historical background, to distinguish a, a representation of one pharaoh from a representation of another. Those who have had some exposure to Egyptian art history will know that there's much discussion about this in the Middle Kingdom when uh, pharaohs like Senwarsa III here uh, were presented in a very naturalistic way. But it's actually true throughout the history of Egypt. So here's a, an old kingdom representation of Userkaf, two uh, representations of the same pharaoh, and you can see they look quite similar to each other. Um, here are two representations of Ramses II, Ramses the Great. This might be put forward as a very generic representation, but if you look at the representations of Ramses, they characteristically have these deep-set dimples, which distinguish his portraits from those of others. Here's Taharqa from the 25th dynasty, one of the Nubian uh, kings of Egypt, also very recognizable portraits. And in the 18th dynasty, to which Tutankhamun belongs, you can see representations of figures like Tutmosis, who have a very um, high arched brow, um, and uh, Queen T, uh, who has these deep furrows in her uh, cheeks and a kind of frowning face across all representations of her. Tutankhamen might look more like a generic, but even here, too, art historians could recognize these out of context as uh, the depictions of that king. And it's worth noting that these representations, though they're wholly distinctive for each pharaoh, don't necessarily resemble the actual individual. So on the right, we see an attempt to reconstruct what Tutankhamen looked like from his mummy and skeletal remains. And you can see he had a kind of buck tooth and he had a cleft palate and he had an extremely receding chin um, and quite a long nose. And none of those features are preserved in the, uh, in the royal portrait. Um, here as well, there were physical um, uh, abnormalities of the body that are not preserved in full body portraits of the king. So what we can say about these cases is that these are archetypes, but they're individualized archetypes. There's a Tutankhamun archetype, there's a Senwarsa III archetype, there's a Ramses the Great archetype, uh, and so on. Um, this kind of idea that you can kind of create archetypes for different uh, image, for different figures in an artistic tradition um, has some cross-cultural uh, robustness. That is, a lot of cultures hit on the idea that what you're doing when you're painting a particular individual is not representing them, but rather creating a pictorial type where pictures of that type uh, resemble each other, even if they don't represent the original individual. So in Byzantine art and Christian art, you see this representation of the Christ figure with kind of uh, wide open eyes and a very long face and a long nose. This actually came from a belief system according to which the original images of Christ were drawn by St. Luke and not drawn in the conventional way of looking and copying what he saw, but through some more supernatural form of transmission. So there was an idea that by preserving this visage, by keeping Christ's face consistent with this tradition, you were actually um, not, not depicting him in a conventional way, but reproducing this kind of magically created image that trace back to, to this original um, direct encounter. And you can see even in this more naturalistic style of painting from Van Eyck, that style of portraiture with those proportions is preserved. Um, another example from, uh, from Benin, if you look at these um, queen mother figures or Ayoba figures, this is from the founding queen of, um, of, of the Edo group. And what you see is very similar representation of the queen. This is Queen Adia across these different representations, even in the bronze on the right, uh, where you have a, a somewhat more naturalistic proportioning, uh, there are ways in which the, the conventions for painting her lips and her nose are preserved. 
So these are recognizable to members of that culture and art historians as representing the same individual, even though there's no reason to think that they were absolute faithful likenesses to the human being. Likewise, in China, you get representations that do have some degree of individuality and naturalism, but there's no reason to suppose that these are photographic likenesses. And indeed, um, as early as the Song Dynasty, there was enormous interest in physiognomy. So um, in, the, in the Song and moving through, through later dynasties like the Yuan and Ming and, and Cheng, you get uh, an effort to represent royal faces in a way that exaggerates features that are indicative of these positive attributes like uh, various forms of prosperity and luck and virtue and health uh, that might be important to, to royal flattery. Um, beginning in the Yuan Dynasty and entering into the Ming, you get a new convention for royal portraiture that's extremely frontal and symmetric um, with the body and face coming down the midline and very decorative uh, robes and, and trappings. And these faces during this period tended to be, get even more stylized. But again, the stylization still allows you to discern who's represented. Um, a little bit later, a, a um, Italian missionary moved to China um, named uh, Giuseppe Castiglione, and he started painting in the royal court using European methods. But you can see he's preserved this frontality and he's preserved certain aspects of idealization. And even later in the Qing dynasty in the 19th century, we get a Scottish photographer named John Thompson moving to China and opening up a portrait studio with photography. Photography was a new instrument then. And uh, he art wrote an article in the 1870s saying that his Chinese sitters and um, and other Chinese um, artists didn't consider the camera more realistic than painting. They thought it was less realistic and problematic. And the thing that bothered them most, he said, is that when a camera captures a face, there are all these shadows. And they thought shadows aren't really part of the face. The face has its internal structure. Shadows are this strange kind of imposition that don't belong inherently to the object. So they tried to generate photos that were shadow free, which proved quite uh, incompatible with that medium. Um, just quickly in Japan, you might look at these sumo wrestlers and think they all look the same. But again, an art historian or a contemporary in the Edo period could easily recognize one of these depictions. And you can see across five different artists here, uh, these two distinct sumo wrestlers are represented in ways that are recognizably similar to each other. Again, no reason to think the wrestler looked like this in any literal way, but the art type uh, gave us an archetype. And this continues even into the, the Meiji when photography comes to Japan. So the Meiji emperor was being photographed by this time, but artists continued to use these very extreme stylizations. Um, in the 20th century in the West, you get artists uh, in modern movements uh, like Picasso's Cubism and post-Cubist paintings using portraiture in a much more abstract mode, but they're still recognizable. So if you look at the various women that were in Picasso's life, art historians can look at these and guess which one of them is representing which of the women. Very little photographic likeness, but they still distinguish are distinguished from each other by their artistic style. So as an exercise, try to guess which woman this is based on the little uh, examples below. And if you're if you're looking studiously, you might have noticed that Picasso represents Dora Maar with a kind of upturned nose. She has a more visible nostrils than some of the others. And he always exaggerates that in his paintings. And in this one, there are little nostrils floating out here um, on, the, on the nose appendage. So an art historian could recognize this as Dora Maar, even though it doesn't actually uh, bear a, a verisimilitude relationship to her. Um, you might think that uh, an artist like this, the photorealist Chuck Close, is giving us representations that do resemble their sitters uh, to a much more profound degree. And while there's some truth to this, even here, it's worth noting that a Chuck Close photorealist portrait differs radically from the person it represents. It's flat or two-dimensional. It's uniformly focused throughout, which is not how we would perceive an actual face. It's enormous in size. It's not moving and it lacks a lower body. So there are all kinds of ways in which any image, no matter how photographic, looks quite different from, from reality. So if we ask how portraits uh, depict, um, resemblance may contribute to this, but it's certainly not necessary or sufficient. 
portrait uh, perception is something we learn to do, and culture impacts how we learn to do that. Um, I don't have a way to track my time. Do I? Can I go on for another five minutes or so? Okay. Um, so, uh, very quickly, just two other uh, I issues I want to address. Um, one is that if we're trying to come up with an account, a scientific account, say, of what portraits depict, it's important to see that they don't just depict individuals. They also comment on those individuals. Portraits are statements. They say things. This portrait says something about um, how the artist uh, Frida Kahlo perceived her, her life uh, circumstances. Uh, this portrait of a royal family by Goya indicates a, a little bit of uh, maybe, if not disrespect, at least a, a sort of humanizing way of viewing them, where he sees their imperfections. Whereas this image of Napoleon by Angre uh, presents the emperor as absolutely idealized and, and perfect. So a lot of commentary going on here. This uh, portrait by Modigliani is a classic example of the male gaze. It's sexualized, it's idealized. His sitter has become almost a doll or a sex toy, uh, dehumanized to the point of being almost a generic. Whereas you see this portrait of two nudes by Alice Neal, um, you see their humanity, their individuality, their agency, their attitudes. Uh, the foreground uh, woman has a certain kind of uh, strength in her contempt uh, for the viewer. And uh, you see here in Micheline Thomas's portrait something alluring and sultry, but this time through a black and queer gaze rather than uh, a male gaze. So there's a lot of commentary in, in that kind of portraiture. Likewise here, Germaine Greer, who was a major figure in the second wave feminist movement, um, is portrayed here by a photographer who did a lot of fashion portrait photography, magazine portrait photography, and she's presented as um, as attractive, as alluring, as strong. Um, whereas this portrait by Diane Arbus captures her vulnerability, her awkwardness. Apparently, uh, according to Greer, Arbus sat her down in her hotel room, had her lie down on her bed. She climbed on top of, of Greer, Arbus did, put her camera in Greer's face and hovered over her for about an hour. And every time she would get uncomfortable and grimace, uh, she'd snap the camera. So Arbus, in a very kind of almost exploitational way, wanted to capture the vulnerability of her sitter. Very different takes on the same topic. Different takes here on vulnerability of adolescents. Gordon Parks showing a, a Harlem gang leader um, for an article in Life magazine, showing a lot of dignity and strength. Um, whereas Renika Dykstra is showing that kind of awkwardness of those, uh, those early teen years. So very different takes on childhood. Um, sometimes the comment is not about the sitter, but about art or politics. So uh, Fali Export was very critical of male dominance in the Austrian art world and portrayed herself as a kind of um, a feminized terrorist taking over the art world there. Cindy Sherman is poking fun at very unnatural idealizations in the history of, the West, of Western art. Um, Sometimes these exaggerations or explorations are about form itself. So uh, in, in Toyin Udutola's work, she's extremely interested in skin, and she thinks the way skin reflects, especially darker skin reflects, has been sort of underexamined by art and resembles textiles in ways that she makes very apparent in her work. So portraits are statements. They convey attitude and comments. And um, often the identity of the sitter is less important than these comments that they're making. Um, final thing very, very quickly, just on evaluation. According to a, a very, I think, tempting view, a good portrait is one we find attractive because attractiveness produces these positive emotions. Some of Dave's presentation tapped into this aspect of aesthetic evaluation. But I think in actual art evaluation, attractiveness is a very small part of the story. There are lots of things that we might um, care about. We, attractiveness of the sitter is only one, Attractiveness of the image is another, composition, complexity, uh, simplicity or graphic impact, the skill of the artist, the originality, the artist's background biographical narrative, the art historical significance of the image, conformity to the artist's own uh, aspirations or to cultural norms, what the image communicates, does it capture its subject, is it truthful or insightful, 
Is it clear or generating interesting forms of puzzlement? Does it have political a punch? Is it provocative? And is it emotionally expressive or arousing? And in terms of how we ultimately evaluate a work, the idea that a good work is the pleasing one, which the attractiveness principle tends to suggest, um, is misleading for many cases. So this is a painting by Felix uh, Felix Nussbaum of his family just shortly before they were carted off to Auschwitz when they were living in hiding um, in, in Brussels. And to say you look at this with pleasure, I think just mischaracterizes the experience of a lot of art. A number of other emotions may enter into the picture. Admiration for the artist or reverence, being impressed by the artist's technique or maybe the artist's courage in producing the work. There are various contemplative emotions like interest or intrigue. An image can be gripping to us. We can be amazed by an artist's achievement. Awe and wonder um, are operative here. And we can also be moved by what the artist works. So I think if we focus too much on attractiveness and pleasure, we'll miss out on this enormous range of emotions that arise when we evaluate artwork as good. So can there be a science of portraits? I think yes, but it's not going to be just cognitive neuroscience. It's going to be all of neuroscience, but also all of psychology, all of art history, plus history, sociology, psychiatry, anthropology, communication, gender studies, political science, philosophy, radiology, as in this x-ray image of a Gentileschi painting, and pretty much every other discipline in the academy. So I think we need to, in approaching art scientifically, remember um, that, that brain science and psychology are only going to work uh, for a small part of the story and need to be in regular conversation with these other fields as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I can hear the echo, so maybe you can, those who didn't mute yourself, maybe you can mute yourself and the echo will be gone. So um, now we'll, we are starting the discussion now, and we traditionally started inviting our two speakers to comment on each other's talks. So if you can do that, that will be great. Both Jesse and David, please. Uh, for myself, I have no particular questions from Jesse. Uh, I congratulate him on a fantastic uh, presentation, but I, I have no questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'm also very happy just to open up to audience uh, talks. One, one very quick thing that I think will probably come up is uh, a lot of the work, Dave, you're doing really is looking at the attitudes of people who are white, straight and cisgendered. And I wonder whether in pursuing this work into the future or in work you've already done, uh, whether you've looked at attractiveness judgments, for instance, or recognition among people who don't fall into those three categories. Yeah, yeah we, we have. Um, um, there's quite a lot, but I, I didn't talk about it. Um, for, for example, if we look at women, uh, sexual orientation is much more fluid than, than classic views would, would suggest. So up to a third of, of uh, young women have had same-sex sexual experience. And if we ask women, how much are you attracted to men or how much are you attracted to women, both of those factors independently predict um, uh, attitudes to masculinity in, in female and male faces. So I think um, that was perhaps predictable, but uh, uh, you're right, we, we were looking in that instance at, at white females and we predominantly looked at, at uh, heterosexual male attitudes. We have looked, begun to look in, in many different cultures at factors contributing to um, attractiveness and there are very interesting uh, cultural differences. Um, but for brevity, I, I kept, kept things about uh, predominantly white, but uh, Western. Uh, but thank you for the comment. Thanks. Okay, great. So we have already a few questions from the audience. And Natasha, would you like to ask your question? Hello. I have a question for Jesse. At the end, when he was talking about being arrested or feeling esteem and admiration or wonder, I thought about the sublime as defined by both Immanuel Kant and Edmund Burke and maybe the earlier French writer Nicolas Boileau. So how does the sublime factor into that last slide? Uh, great, great question. And actually, I, at the top of that, I cited a paper that Jörg Fingerhut and I wrote in a recent issue of the philosophy journal The Monist, where we catalog some of these aesthetic emotions. And, and in that survey, we actually include 
uh, the sublime. So there we put it in in that last category of emotions of amazement. Um, and as you as you point out, there are these different conceptions uh, of the sublime. It kind of um, emerges originally in 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 poetics where it's meant to characterize stories that are kind of dramatic and exciting. And there, in visual medium, it might be cued to, to things that are heroic, um, triumphal. Uh, but it began to be associated with a certain, uh, in Burke especially, a certain kind of um, fear at a distance, presenting things that are threatening, but with uh, enough aesthetic distance to uh, to be able to take them in in a way that's uh, that's rewarding. And of course, Kant has a version of that, but also a mathematical sublime and others. So I think one way to move forward on this is to really take this notion of the sublime seriously. I think it's probably culturally informed. So there's this wonderful work by Mark Rico Nicholson, arguing that interest in landscape uh, and mountain landscapes in particular kind of emerged at a particular moment in, in European history and has a, another parallel history in China that I'm quite interested in. But it's only under those conditions that grandeur gets aestheticized and represented um, in art. So if you look, for example, at Japanese painting, uh, there's some very derivative work that builds on Chinese tradition that uses mountains. But mountains as the central subject matter is much more characteristic of China than it is of, of Japan or of Korea. And likewise, the landscape with mountains in it appears really only for a brief period in European history. Sorry for interrupting, Jesse. I'm really sorry for interrupting. But can please everybody else mute themselves? Because it's really very hard to hear you, Jesse. I guess that's because of the... Yeah, thank you. It's better now. Um, anyway, uh, just, just to say, I, I, I wonder, I really revel in the question. And I think one really exciting way forward in the psychology of art is thinking about some of these concepts that have been articulated in the history of philosophy and in art history and trying to show where they crop up in different uh, aesthetic response traditions, um, both looking cross-culturally and in the presence. And I think Sublime belongs very much on that list. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Natasha. Um, we have another question from Sydney Harvey. Could you please ask your question? Hi. Um, so question is for Jesse. Oh, am I echoing? Are we good? Yeah, I'm afraid we all have to mute ourselves as soon oh, as. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but please ask your question. I'm gonna stay unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right. So you talked about just a little bit about um, the caricature of Jesus, and I think that it that um, pro, that portrait. Um, of Jesus um, would be very particular in America. Like, the, okay, so like your concept that um, the social background or the or the racial background or the ethnic background can change the way the character um, presents itself. And so I'm thinking of like, you know, I'm biracial and both of my grandparents um, were Christian, but one was white and one was black. And they had completely different representations of Jesus in their house. And I thought it was the craziest thing because they lived two streets apart and never had a real answer for me as to why why the same person would look completely different, you know, depending on the household. And of course, as an adult woman, I know it's because people want their Jesus to look like them. But it seems like it's such a common um, scenario with Jesus that it, it seems to be like a perfect example of your point. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. It's it, and you can look at this. I mean, there are different lineages of Christianity, and and they do have different pictorial uh, traditions. In this particular case, that iconography, which was associated with the Eastern Church, um, with the Byzantine Church, did manage to kind of trickle into um, early Renaissance painting, like in the Van Eyck example. But it was quickly replaced by new archetypes. But those archetypes were even more sort of obviously white western and even northern european you can see albrecht durer painting blonde jesus figures um and uh and tracing you know aesthetic representations among ethiopian uh christendom or there were christians in you know along the silk road who were moving into india moving even into china so i think it would be a great great project to uh to look at how those variations reflect the local viewership
Thanks a lot. Um, thank you for your question. Um, so nobody's raising their hands, if I'm not mistaken. But if you have any questions, please either write them down in the chat or ask them. So since no one is asking right now, I'll use that just to quickly. I have two questions for both of you, but maybe I'll begin with David. David, I agree with Jesse that attractiveness is not the only thing about portraits, but nevertheless, I have a question about attractiveness. Um, what you found, I guess, especially about the color and how it's related to health and how a healthier colored faces are perceived as more attractive. So this is quite in line with the evolutionary view of beauty, right? Um, I was just wondering, I, I know that this evolutionary view on beauty, uh, that beauty is related to survival, it's also it's general quite in aesthetics and not just about the beauty of the face. Say, I know some research which found that uh, the landscapes which contain water, like lakes or rivers, are perceived as more beautiful compared to the landscapes which don't. Um, so this is a pretty strong view in aesthetics that is related to evolution and survival. But I just have a question to you. Do you agree with that view? Or maybe beauty is not only about this evolution and survival. Maybe it's about something else. Or do you think that this is a primarily point of beauty? health, survival, and stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Well, th th I took a, a positive uh, attitude for to take a stance to present. Uh, but I have to admit that the evidence doesn't stack up entirely. If you take um, strong cues to health, there's more cross-cultural agreement has been found on, on the, uh, oxygenated blood. Um, if you take a, a weaker cue that has very little to do with health, but in the long term can affect it, for example, melanin suntan, you get huge cultural variation in what's attractive. And I think you can have that variation because it's not strongly linked to a um, selective advantage. Um, another cue that I've worked on a lot uh, is a yellow-orange cue, um, carotenoids. Um, they are uh, very popular in, in both black and uh, European um, populations. Less so, but there's a little bit of evidence for that in 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 uh, in China. So, taking just um, cues from skin pigment, um, then you can see a cultural variation. I mean, there are a lot of cues that I think show cultural variation. I mean, emotional expressions are largely similar, and I'm sure that everybody likes a happy face, um, but. Uh, the precise uh, uh, musculature used in expressions turns out to be different across the cultures if you look very carefully at those. So everywhere you look in detail, you found cultural differences, um, even though you might find um, for strong cues, I think you find more uh, agreement. Um, so I, I want to have my cake and eat it. I want to say, yes, there's strong cues and they're probably uh, imbued by evolution, but if we look very carefully, we will find cultural differences as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, just another question for JC. Um, do you think there are any difference in how people perceive face in real life compared to how people perceive faces and portraits? Because we cannot discuss that during most of our seminars and how perception in real life differs or not from perception in art? Thank you. Great question. I, for, I mean, one of the problems, of course, is that the methods by which we study face perception in psychology typically use photographs. Um, so we're already getting a kind of ecological validity issue. That is to say, we're, we're presenting faces in a way that is more characteristic of art presentation of faces than of actual encounters with faces in, in the real world. So it's, it's a bit hard to know. I mean, I do think there are general features of perception like prototypes or peak shift principles that say shifting towards what's typical for the category instance contributes to recognition. And we might expect that to be true across picture represent, picture perception and person perception. But what we're missing, uh, to name uh, one example, in our research on face perception is um, dynamism, for example, the face in motion. In emotion research, it's been found that presenting people with a dynamic face as opposed to a still image significantly impacts how recognition 
um, takes place. And a typical human face is not in its neutral mode uh, much of the time, but first of all, seen from skewed angles, seen in a dynamic um, motion, but also uh, speaking and expressing emotion in ways that lead to various uh, distortions from the from the neutral standing position. So I'd love to see more work that looked at that. And of course, those are precisely the kinds of contributions we might expect to differentiate face perception from, from picture perception. One just final thing on this, all perception involves comparison to an, of an input to an equivalence class that's been stored in memory. And I think when we look at pictures, the equivalence class we draw on is characteristically other pictures. So the, you know, the, the thing by which we recognize is just a different set of stored records in the case of seeing a friend and seeing uh, an, a picture. There's blurring of that in selfie culture and social media culture. We're all pretty used to seeing these photographic reproductions of those we know. Uh, so that might be changing, but I think characteristically there's been at least that difference. Um, if I can uh, just follow up to to, to your um, answer, Jesse. Well, I guess something that you, you raised uh, is indeed that there are those uh, elements about portraits and faces that are not really uh, very much studied. Um, and then I, I wonder, I can, uh, um, I mean, uh, David, I wondered, to, uh, I wanted to, to have your, th uh, your thoughts um, about what you think, how those things could be implemented in uh, the methodology and uh, in, uh, in psychology and study of faces and how, what, what do you think would be the best way to study those characteristics? Uh, I have to admit, I was trying to ask one of the questions that came in the chat line, uh, which particular qualities were you referring to? Um, I guess Jesse was talking about uh, the dynamism. Uh, in yeah, the, oh, the dynamism, yeah. Um, I think that's, a, well, in our brains, it's a whole extra system for recognizing moving pattern. So it, it's, a, it, it's a particular interest to me, but it, it, it's, it's quite separate. Um, so there will be different mechanisms, not all of the same uh, parameters will, will, will be the same. Uh, that's a, probably a poor answer because, again, I apologize, trying to multitask. Uh, I didn't really listen to all of the value. Um, no, that's totally fine. And I guess uh, if there are questions in the chat, uh, perhaps uh, uh, we could invite people to, uh, to read them aloud so we can engage in the conversation. Uh, you, Riley, can you please the hand, the hand labeled N or is that Unico? Sorry, sorry. I see one hand icon. Yes, oh. Natasha, ask a question. Well, we have questions in the in the chat now. So, Mirali, do you want to ask your question? Hi, David. Um, um, so, so there were a bunch of crows nesting in my garden, um, and uh, these crows are able to selectively recognize me from my from that of my father, who looks very similar to me, and there are other people in the compound. Uh, who look like me, but um, but the crow is able to selectively easily identify me even when I changed uh, different uh, dresses and stuff like that. So I was wondering if your research informs to the fa uh, to the idea that while I can't distinguish between these different species, these crows, uh, the some of these species are able to identify humans very selectively. Yeah, it, it's an enormous problem for any social animal. You've got a, uh, a whole array of, of conspecifics you've got to identify. And I, I think it's a fabulous and, and a complex task that, that each species undergoes, whether they're wasps or whether they're set herring gulls. But I, I would point out that crows in the ultraviolet have got extra pattern. They also see in the ultraviolet. So it, it makes it a little bit easier for them. It's still remarkable that they would uh, choose to and be able to recognize different humans. So I don't really have an answer, except, you know, it's very difficult for us to rec recognize. And I think it's for all these social animals, uh, recognizing kin and, and partners is is paramount. And how they do it is 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 brilliant and largely unknown. Thanks a lot. Um, we have another question from Murali, but I wanted to give a chance for Tram to ask her question. Hi, 
Hi, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a question uh, for, for both of the speaker. Um, wh what do you think about self-portraits? So in terms of research and in, in the perception of, of attractiveness, for, for example, um, how um, it, is there anything to say about how our perception of our own uh, appearance, our own uh, attractiveness in comparison with other perception of ourselves and uh, in terms of um, arts like what, what um, um, how do you um, the artists that that doing self portraits of themselves like uh, the interpretation of the art can you can you say something about that thank you I can address the psychology briefly um, basically if somebody finds themselves attractive or even thinks themselves attractive they become more competitive in the world and prize things like symmetry and, and beauty in others more. So you, particularly in, in, in potential partners. So you get this uh, own evaluation of self when that goes up, uh, people become more competitive. So symmetry is most popular amongst um, attractive men and women. Um, so that, that's a psychology question. You've asked about depiction. I think I have to defer to uh, Jesse here. Um, little to add, I mean, I, I, for me, one of the things that's been most interested in think, interesting in thinking about portraits is the degree to which it, it underscores the idea that art is a kind of language. Even though vision contributes to our understanding of art, we come up with, with kind of iconic or in symbolic ways of representing individuals. And if you think about the artists most associated with self-portraiture, people, people like Rembrandt or Egon Schiele or Frida Kahlo, um, in the West. Uh, Max Beckmann would be another one. It would be very difficult to give you a pattern about attractiveness. I do think some will give flattering self-portraits, maybe Rembrandt and Frida Kahlo will. Um, it's, it's less clear whether we could characterize the emaciated and gaunt look of Egon Schiele's self-portraits as attractive or, or the stern, bulbous, round-headed, uh, dark-eyed uh, Max Beckmann portraits as attractive. Their aesthetic tradition of expressionism sort of moved away from these ideals of beauty and tried to create work that had a little bit uh, more provocative verve. So I think their choice vis-a-vis -vis attractiveness is more a function of their aesthetic aspirations as members of art movements uh, than of any general pattern among artists to, um, uh, to maybe inflate their own uh, beauty. But one thing that's quite striking in, in each of these cases is if you look at, in the case of the 20th century painters, photographic representations of these artists, there are all kinds of ways in which their paintings are not perfectly faithful. And uh, they're quite close in resemblance to one another, but not necessarily perfect likenesses of the sitter, despite the availability of photographic uh, reproduction as, as a source. So again, creating an icon for oneself almost an avatar of oneself in art, as opposed to uh, trying to, to create a painting that serves as a photo or a mirror. Can I follow that up, Jesse, and ask about uh, self-depiction in, in Oriental art? I mean, if you take a society that's more collectivist, um, do we see any self-portraits? There's there's very, very little of it. And I mean, in, in Chinese painting, you know, Figuration, th these royal portraits were, were all commissioned by court artists. Most of them were actually used ceremonially. ceremonially. They would be brought out for, um, for New Year's, uh, uh, for instance, or for memorial services. Um, and they were really meant to be a stand-in of the figure. And because of that, some of them were painted um, post-mortem. And when, even when they weren't, they really were made in an almost ceremonial way for the thought of these future ceremonies when, when the figure would be uh, departed. Um, and a lot of the earliest figurative work in, in Chinese art is in tomb paintings. Somebody in the chat asked about the terracotta uh, soldiers. And I think in all these cases, they're doing pretty much the same thing. The artists are taking an archetype. Maybe they've looked at the soldier, but they're almost like a caricature artist. They're trying to capture the one thing that might reflect the person's individuality in a symbolic way rather than through verisimilitude. And uh, you don't really get self-portraiture until uh, late periods, 19th century, 20th century. In Japan, many of the ukiyo-e artists were 
portrayed, but always by others. So you can find portraits of uh, the, the most prolific Ukewe painter, um, who is um, a Kunisada, or Toyo Kuni uh, III, um, but it wasn't painted by him. It was painted by one of his students. And it was only with European, European influence in the Meiji period, where Japanese art gave up on its traditional methods and adopted oil painting, that you start to see traditions of self-portraiture. And there the European influence is so strong that uh, pretty much what I said about European portraiture would follow there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mirad, do you want to ask your question about Terracotta Army or not, or are you happy with what Jess just said? Um, I, I, I guess I'm, I guess uh, what I would like to know is that co combining it with what uh, David uh, presented, is there a definitive way to say that these weren't uh, sculpt, these were the sculptors didn't have individual uh, uh, soldiers pose for the for the sculpture? Um, but but it's maybe is it it maybe it is a generic variation. So they just took uh, they just took an average sculpt uh, average face and then they modified exaggerated certain features. Or did they actually have uh, uh, soldiers six thousand soldiers individually pose? Is is there a way to combine your research and David's research to 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 answer what exactly happened? My own guess is that they, they, first of all, they know the bodies were generics. And this was true in later portraiture. Those, those terracotta sculptures are from the third century BCE. And the royal portraits I was showing you begun from the Song dynasty. We're talking about the, you know, the 11th century you know, uh, CE. So huge, huge time gap between them. But there's a similarity, which is with the royal portraits, uh, the poser would uh, sit for the face but not for the body. The body was always a kind of generic uh, painted, painted in the studio. I think the idea of sitting in front of your subject and copying them probably didn't exist in China in the third century BCE, but I do, I do think it's plausible that the, the artists, and there were, there were many, many of them, um, presumably, uh, developed techniques for capturing human variation by looking at actual individuals. I doubt that each soldier is uh, is available to sit for for an artist, and there's enough uniformity and style in those head sculptures to think that the artisans were really trained in fairly generic, normalized modes of, of production. But I do think they were looking at a range of faces to get um, a, an appropriate uh, set of aesthetic tools for showing diversity of that kind. You do see certain types. Uh, for example, of facial hair repeating themselves if you if you start to look at large numbers of them. When we in the West get these on exhibit, we usually, you know, see see a small number that are selected for their diversity, and they are each unique. Uh, but there there is more commonality in them than we would expect if they were faithful copies. Thank you very much. I enjoyed both your talks. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your question. And we have a question from Zhang. Zhang, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great talk, Jesse and David. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm from computer science background, so I'm doing quite a lot of artificial intelligence projects. I just wonder, um, so so in both of your talks, you actually analyze like, you know, either the attractiveness of faces or like the, how we analyze self portraits and so on. I wonder, have you ever looked at some of the uh, AI generated portraits, uh, you know, like the, for example, the link I provided in the chat, it, it, it is one of the first portraits that are generated by uh, artificial intelligence. I, I wonder what, what's your, um, how do you analyze uh, such uh, portraits that uh, are generated by AI? And on the other hand, I would also like to understand, like, you know, in your talk, you actually mentioned, you know, all these portraits actually reflect the, uh, the, the the personality or emotions of the artist as well, right? Or the uh, the, the the person on the portraits. So, uh, would would there exist any? If you have analyzed those uh, portraits that are generated um, by AI, have you uh, found any commonalities or like maybe we could find the personality of the AI or something? Yeah, I'm just curious to know. 
Thank you. My, I mean, I, I obviously um, don't work in the area, but I do from my sense of what, especially some of the uh, deep neural networks, the machine learning neural networks do, is they you know, tend to have enormous um, databases to work from. And they are doing something that's closer in spirit to, to what uh, Dave has been studying. So this aspect that involves a kind of statistical learning and averaging seems to be very important to the production. Now, I don't know how the algorithms then introduce a style to get these uh, AI artists to produce in a consistent way. That may be a bit more top down. Um, but I think that when you reduce a portrait to likeness, which is this aggregation of, um, of images from a database and style, you are missing out, uh, uh, Zhang, if I may, on what you just mentioned at the end. It's really the imposition of the artist. And the artist's imposition is not simply in their technique. It's often in their viewpoint. So I would like to see in the future, of, I have great confidence in where AI can go with this, but I'd like to see in the future um, AI artists that really um, have a perspective, a point of view that they want to get across, a political position, a position on, you know, attitudes towards towards gender. Um, is it the male gaze? Is it, you know, is it a straight gaze? All those questions are things that I think uh, people working in AI should be uh, thinking more actively about. Yeah, thank I you. Very... This is a uh, very insightful. Yeah, thank sorry. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the link. I, I hadn't seen um, such portraits before and they're fascinating. And I mean, I think I agree with Jesse. I mean, um, AI's, well, the, if you're learning by example, then it's possible to develop different styles, I'm sure, uh, with AI and, and introduce different perspectives. So I'm sure in the future we will see art uh, multiply in, in, in terms of um, for different styles. I mean, it, it, it's going to be very possible. So it's an interesting area and, and a creative one. Um, so, and probably there'll be Thank AI you. doing things that no human has. So we, we, we're just going to wait and see, mm -hmm. I think, as a passive um, connoisseur of this. Thank you very Thanks. much. See. Thank you. Yeah, I have um, a comment uh, more than a question, but I just wanted to uh, to expand on what Jesse you, you said um, about you. You've been referencing to the male gaze, and uh, you've been talking about art history and how that can be, um, and the ideas from art history. How can they be integrated in uh, into uh, research? And so I'm wondering, uh, for example, I mean, just looking at the X-ray of uh, the uh, Artemisia Gentileschi, uh, Susanna and the elders, uh, that changes drastically the perception uh, of uh, what is already uh, a quite uh, stressful uh, painting to look at. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking, um, knowing uh, perhaps and giving context uh, uh, like an art historical context to face perception in, uh, in portraits and in paintings. Um, could that be something interesting to to then um, to then investigate in uh, in psychology? I'm thinking, for example, thinking of the male gaze. There's the Manet uh, um, painting when we have the the picnic scene where there's the naked woman surrounded by all dressed men. So seeing her face outside the the context uh, will have a very different well the, the perception of her face will have will be very different compared to the context in which the painting is uh, uh, is the, is portraying that face um so yeah it's, just, it's not really a question it's just more a consideration how would that well if that would be something interesting to see uh, in the future in, uh, in in psychology and how that can be integrated more um yeah, kind of art history into into research. And if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I, to me, that that really uh, speaks to me, that comment, because I think, you know, in, in addition to the gaze of the artist, there's the gaze of the viewer. There's work um, in a lot of, uh, for example, black feminist thought about the, the identity of the viewer coming to these things that might be created through the male gaze, but now get re-experienced through a different perspective. 
um, but it certainly is important in our in our understanding and response to the art. So most people here will know that Suzanne and the Elders is a biblical story that involves a young woman who is bathing in the nude and two older um, men are leering at her. Um, that's the basic subject matter of the painting, already a kind of fraught subject matter for the painting. But Artemisia um, was herself, and this is a trigger warning, so apologies for, for going into some sensitive terrain. She was assaulted by a friend of her father's, and her father was not particularly kind to her in negotiating that aftermath. And so when, uh, when she paints Susanna and the Elders, it just has very different meaning. This is no longer you contributing to the leering gaze. This is actually an indictment of it. And if you look at her underpainting that was revealed through X-ray, you can see that as harrowing as the final product is, she actually labored over it and she created two other renditions of the um, face of Susanna that are actually more horrific, more um, emotionally charged than the one she ended up with, perhaps trying to conform to uh, the sensibilities of her com commissioner. Um, but I do think it's important that we recognize that if you know this story, or even if you just know the sex of the artist and look at a depiction of Susanna and the elders, it, it changes the experience quite profoundly. Um, something that we might find uh, titillating um, can turn into something that's almost traumatic. And um, I think that's part of our experience. It's something that should be studied, but it's not just a kind of accident or it's not a bit of noise um, or bias that's, that's disrupting our ability to respond to artworks. I think it's integral to what the experience of art is or should be. That is, we always bring our knowledge to bear, and that's an important part of what the artist is trying to communicate and what we as viewers are trying to recover. Yeah, if I can just add to that, the, the, the traditional uh, representation of Susanna and the Elders was actually uh, the, the Susanna kind of gazing at the viewer and a kind of in a uh, in a more fl in a flirtatious way. So and there's there are two versions of Tintoretta that actually play with that and with the mirror that kind of uh, Susanna is reflecting herself in the mirror. So definitely there there's this um this the, that painting in this tradition is has even a stronger um that has an even a stronger emotional uh, experience of that painting uh, coming from that tradition um thank you very much um i think we um we have very uh very uh, few other minutes to um uh, to our conversation and perhaps we usually um, ask our speakers to share a little bit of their uh, personal um, uh, background and how they, um, they decided to, well, how they, they approached aesthetics and uh, um, to, to inspire uh, younger uh, researchers that might uh, be listening to us. So I wonder if you, uh, Jesse and, and David, would like to, to share your, uh, your thoughts, your experience. Dave? Oh, you're muted. Taking the sneaky way out. Uh, I, I think you should go first, set an example. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, I, I've spoken too much. I mean, I, I, it's it's predictable. I, first of all, I do have a fine art background in secondary school. I studied uh, visual art, um, studio art. So, so art has always been, I joke that um, you know, philosophy is my blood, uh, but art is the heart that pumps it. So I, I really feel very close connection to art. Um, but I'm also obsessively interested in art history. Um, so when I began working as a cognitive scientist and I didn't present experimental work here, but I also run a um, an experimental lab, that abiding interest has always um, guided my, my um, experimental practice. So um, I, I think it's been very, very exciting to see psychology return to what it was doing at its inception, which is taking aesthetic experience as a core part of human experience and studying it with as much vigor and seriousness as any other aspect of, of the human mind. So fields like neuroaesthetics and aesthetic psychology have really been blossoming in the last couple of decades in ways that, that excite me. Um, the number of people doing that who actually make contact with, with our history is still uh, depressingly limited. And, and David is a wonderful 
exception to that, as, as we saw. Um, but I think it's, you know, we, when I was trained as a cognitive scientist, interdisciplinarity meant psychology, philosophy, neuroscience, and AI. I think interdisciplinary also involves history, you know, critical race theory, um, feminist theory, sociology. Uh, if we start to look at the sources of information that can go into studying as rich a human experience as art, um, we immediately see new ways of expanding our scientific methods and new conversations across disciplinary boundaries that haven't yet been brokered. There is enormous skepticism among art historians towards neuroesthetics and aesthetic psychology, and rightfully so. Um, but at the same time, they are talking about things like the period I, how does perception change over time? Those are questions that psychologists have tools to, to weigh in on. So I kind of look forward to a period where, you know, freaks like, like me and, and David who have these combined interests and, um, and take them seriously can work to make better communication across these fields. Briefly, I could add to that. I, mean, I was always frustrated. Uh, I'm not an, in any way artistic, but I, I found that you could use scientific method to uh, study uh, art and even make representations. And I think that will be increasingly easy with uh, technological, technically able individuals, young individuals in, in the future. Plus, I, I think I, I was told formally uh, having tried to publish an article on, on beauty, I was told in no uncertain matter that, that some things subjects should not be studied and beauty was one of them. This was in, in a journal. Uh, uh, but I mean, actually, you, you can take any subjective experience and, and uh, begin to apply scientific principles to, to find whether they're commonality. I think the, the whole aspect of, of uh, well, beauty and, and aesthetics are, are ripe for studying. I mean, I think there's very little uh, psychology of, of aesthetics. Um, I'm busy testing notions of fashion matching. And I mean, I find a huge uh, amount of advice coming from stylists, but no scientific testing whatsoever. So, I mean, I think for young people setting out, there's a, you know, there's a vast amount of work to do, um, finding out, applying psychological behavioral principles and, and finding out um, about aesthetics and what are common underlying principles. If, if there's going to be many, just like beauty, it's going to have multi, multifaceted. So I think it's, it's a very, uh, it, it's a really good area to start working. And I think, thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to mention that usually Nicole and I ask these questions in the end because many researchers in aesthetics, especially junior ones, they complain that aesthetics is not taken seriously as a topic, at least in psychological research. And it's very hard to say publish a paper in a high ranking journal because they think that aesthetic is not and beauty is not serious. So that's why we ask these questions for you to give some advice and just encourage that this is an important topic. Thank you. Just, just following up, I mean, I think that that uh, the very fact that people dismiss it makes it more important. And for young people, they shouldn't be put off by that. They should redouble their efforts. Uh, they'll they'll be entering into an area that's wide open, and uh, they'll make a, a mark for you know. I mean, they will have a, a good future. Sorry to come back. One one thing I often say to to people is. Neuroscience used to think ethics was out of its purview. And then in 20, uh, 2001, this paper came out, Josh Green doing trolley dilemmas, and it created a cottage in industry of neuroimaging studies related to ethics, which is now a robust and, and important area of social neuroscience. But I asked people, how many ethical decisions do you make a day? And there are some, but how many aesthetic decisions? And it turns out when people reflect on it, they discover their entire day is organized around aesthetic decisions. What am I gonna have for breakfast? What am I gonna wear? How am I gonna arrange my food on the plate? What am I gonna listen to on my commute? Um, who am I gonna try and sit next to on the, on the tube? All of those things that we do, uh, and of course the enormous investment we make in watching movies and going to museums and in, in, uh, in listening to music, are core to our daily experience. 
And if psychology can't play a role in a analyzing that aspect of experience, it's not really earning its keep as the science of the, of the human mind and human behavior. So I think we really owe it uh, to ourselves as a field to spend more time on aesthetics than we have. Thank you very much both. And I think Marina also said thank you, but <laughs> I, I, I couldn't I couldn't hear. Um, I just wanted to um, I to mention that um, uh, next week uh, we'll have a seminar on creativity with Rebecca Chamberlain and Dustin Stokes. Uh, so I just like to wrap up and thanks very much again our speakers today. It's been a great uh, discussion and uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. Um, thank uh, you for thank you for the organizing it. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Yeah.